Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends. Episode 86 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is Byron. I'm here with my buddy Gary. How's everybody doing today? I hope they're all doing great. Today we have two interviews, uh, two guys that are submit- competing in Submission Series Pro, The Takeover. It's uh, on June 20th in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah, so double interview, Gary. Two for the price of one. What more can you ask for? I don't know. Maybe three, sale. but <laughs> summer <laughs> sale on our <laughs> interviews. That's right, buddy. No, but uh, we had... Uh uh, Cat Clark is the uh, organizer of this, and if you listen to some episodes back, we had uh, talked to uh, a couple of the, the fighters from a previous uh, event they put on. Yeah. So, uh, always a good time. Uh, uh, we're going to fill ourselves with knowledge and learn learn some stuff. Yep, you could go to submissionseriespro.ca, and it's got all the information. There's, it's a great card that, that they've got up there. And last time, they had some amazing fights. They're 15-minute uh, fights submission only and they had some like nail biters a lot of action man so it uh, i'm looking forward to this one are they streaming this one online too do you know i haven't heard uh yes or no on that i, I need I know to check last their time it was check out their facebook page and they'll probably have information there yeah so uh definitely looking forward to this event and if you aren't able to go live uh check online you know like their facebook page and and uh check them out they got a lot of cool stuff up there so that's this week, guys, on the show. We've got, like I said, double interview. We have uh, Jason Gagnon and Josh Wincy, uh, two of the top competitors there. Uh, Jason's a brown belt under Cobrinha, and uh, Josh is a black belt under Kevin Taylor. So that's coming at you here in a little bit. we got some other stuff to talk about. Gary, we have a uh, big congratulations is in order uh, to our buddy Bernardo Faria. Yeah, I see he uh, just lit it up this uh, this past weekend here. Um one is open, one is class, and then one the uh, the absolute. Uh, very, very impressive. That is amazing. World champion, uh, double gold, man. Hey, episode. If you want to go back, and listen. Episode forty nine is is Bernardo's episode. He's he's just a guy. You could tell he was smiling the whole interview. We did, did it over the phone, but you could just tell he's having a good time, and he, he just he just loves jujitsu, and you can, you'd really pick that up in his interview. Uh, episode forty eight, right before Bernardo's, Yuri Samoas took third place. And uh, episode seventy, Isaac Doderline took second in his brown belt division. So, man, that's kind of neat. Just the amount of people we've had that you know did very well at Worlds. Uh, you know, uh, uh, James Papalo we just interviewed, uh, Jared Dopp. Um, so we've had a, a ton of people uh, uh, competing at the Worlds, and, and uh, it's pretty neat. Pretty neat to be able to talk to these people and get their advice. Yeah, and get to know them better, and, and yeah, they they all give advice to grapplers out there that aren't uh, obviously not as experienced as they are, but uh, it's all good to get to learn, and that's one of the the big things about doing this show like this, man. It's a good time. Good time. We also have some news about uh, a huge jujitsu seminar coming up in Baltimore, Maryland. It's the. Uh uh, Mission Twenty Two uh, Jiu Jitsu Seminar. It's a great cause. Um, definitely, uh, we'll put a link on it. You, a link on our website. You want to check it out? Yeah, they've got. It uh, looks like at least uh, ten world class uh, BJJ competitors and black belts. They're going to be teaching. Um, looks like it's uh, hundred dollars per day or one hundred fifty for all three days. Uh, at July thirty first. And uh, all the money and proceeds go to uh, Mission 22, which is a organization that helps uh, veterans returning, you know, from uh, active duty, uh, like suicide prevention and awareness type of thing. So that's a that's definitely a a very worthy cause. And then uh, any money that you you know pay to the seminar, which is a, a bargain anyway, um, really, it's a lot of times the. The people who are teaching it are giving their time. Yeah, they're, they're giving their like, time away. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, the charity. Yeah, yeah, a three day seminar, a hundred bucks a day, or or one hundred and fifty for all three days, and and like you said, it, it's Mission Twenty Two. Uh, uh, check out their website, uh, Mission Twenty Two dot com. Um, basically, it's uh, the military vets uh, coming back home, uh, you know, fighting the war at home. Um, definitely, uh, it's a great cause and uh, help out great people who who. Uh, who we need to help out yep and if you go look at the list of names we've interviewed a bunch of them so uh if you need a little bit more uh, motivation to to meet the people go check out interviews you know gary let's uh hit the quote of the week up here man 
Always my favorite time. Let's go. I'm, I'm kind of a quote guy. I like I like quotes a lot. One of my favorite is the Hicks and Gracie quote, and I use that a lot with my students. Is uh, I think you know it's true strength is not always shown through victory. Get up, um, show strength of heart, and try again. And so I think that's really you know the message that I have because I know I've lost some tough matches, but I know that every time I keep getting better and better, and I keep getting closer to my goals, and that that's really like it's kind of interesting but i've really come to understand that how losing is very important part of the process and that those temporary defeats and the the little failures that you have are what propel you forward so i've always been a huge huge fan of that quote that you know it's like winning doesn't always mean you know losing doesn't mean that you've lost right a lot of times that that lesson that you get and the process of pushing yourself and trying to you know go outside of your comfort zone is really a huge part of why we're here as human beings trying to trying to get better and trying to you know hopefully become an know a more optimized version of ourselves as we go so i definitely think jiu-jitsu is a, a great vehicle for that so but definitely my favorite quote that was our buddy james Popolo from last week's episode uh, with Hicks and Gracie, quote, true strength is not always shown through victory. Stand up, try again, and display strength of heart. Hicks and Gracie. And man, that does mean so much right there. You know, stand up, compete again, try again. That's that's a true true warrior right there, the determination. Don't quit. Just keep uh, keep getting back up and keep trying again. Yeah. It's what, it, what you do. You know, it's easy if it, if you're like me and Gary always talk about like playing basketball with with uh, kindergartners or you know playing dodgeball with little kids or whatever. Uh, we're pretty good at that. But when um, you know you, you face some adversity and things don't go well, that's if you want to build strength. If if you have true strength, you know, you say, okay, that this day kind of sucked. You know, I it did not go well for me. True strength. Get up. Um, do, you know, don't give up on your dream or your goals or or. Uh, or what you're trying to do, and uh, keep going. Show that true strength. Yeah, think about how many people in the years you've been training that you've seen come in a couple times or or face a setback um, or just show up to class the first time and, and just get mauled and, you know, thought they were pretty good. You never see them again. But then go back and think of the guy that, you know, showed up the first day, showed up the first month, struggled, had – really was just absolutely atrocious but just kept coming back just kept coming back and and now you see that person you know five years later they're still going you and everybody else they train with you have so much respect for that person and and that person is now just a beast on the mat i I see it every day i see it with the majority of people i train with i have so much respect for the person who just keeps coming jujitsu is not a easy task Uh, you're gonna get put in bad positions you're going to be uncomfortable you're going to be hurt you're going to be breathing hard your neck's going to be cranked but uh just keep getting keep doing it keep keep coming back don't quit and uh you'll enjoy the fruits of your labor yeah even even some of the the people who you might think of that are you know athletically gifted or good at jujitsu um if, if sometimes when they're faced with adversity they they really lack some of that true strength of heart and uh it's, that's a that's a big thing to have to have some strength in, you know. So true. Another great reason why it's, you know jujitsu or sports in general is good for kids. You know, help them build that heart. You know, and help them. You know, if if uh, face a little adversity on the any sort of a sport and you, you stick in there and, and maybe you get better, maybe you don't, but you you don't, you don't lose heart and you keep trying. That's uh, that's big character building right there. Yeah, character building is going to prepare you for the real life. Real life's the same way when you're in business or your job or or whatever relationships everything's not going to be a home run you're going to you're going to have a lot of uh of valleys in your life and uh, you just got to keep climbing yep that was presented by james Popolo uh last week's interview um great interview last week and we, we i know gary we had a great time talking to him so uh, yep yeah. and we'll definitely uh, try to get him on again there sometime for for everybody because yep. i know you guys all enjoyed it uh gary sent me uh so we were texting back and forth uh before the show here about article of the week and uh gary's like I'm, i got one I, i'll figure one out here and he sent me a link and i pulled it I'll open tell you, it's perfect <laughs> yeah 
I open that thing up and I'm looking at my phone and it's not loaded yet and I kind of scroll and like it loaded like the header of the of the of the page and I scroll down it's got the stuff on the bottom I'm like man okay I put it down and I and I you know do some other work on the podcast pick it up again like in a minute and I'm like okay it still didn't load so then I get ready to type it in on my computer to go to the the same web page you know I'm like wait a minute maybe it did there was like a little bit of text in the middle Gary what is this article you found what's it called <laughs> I tell you this is a great article uh, the one secret trick. To be getting to getting good at BJJ, and uh, it's basically a, a caneprevost dot com. Um, we'll put a link to it there. But um, uh, great article, and I thought the same thing. And, and I know you guys will all think the same thing. You'll you'll be like, hey, it's not loading. Just scroll down. Um, it's it's kind of funny, but it's the most true thing I've ever seen in, in the world. I just saw this. <laughs> this article and i was like man this is it um i don't know what byron will think about it when he sees how short it is but uh in my opinion i i think this is the essence right here so gary usually we don't read the entire article um on uh, on the show here we just kind of you know summarize it or, or just pick out a few key points but, yeah, i think uh, i'll read this one to you guys. Can you read the whole thing for him nobody minds yeah. well i'm sitting down i'm relaxed and ready to go okay once again the the article is called the one secret trick to getting good at bjj go to class regularly listen to your instructor you are welcome technically that may be too that's the entire article (laughs) that's it (laughs) but you know you think of today everybody's always looking for that super pill that that shortcut that you know way to get good at anything and uh Basically, uh, it's summed up right here. What you need to do to get good, go to class regularly. Not once a month, not once every two weeks. Go to class regularly. And then the bonus advice, listen to your instructor. He's an instructor for a reason. He or she is an instructor for a reason. That's how you get good. There's no shortcut. That's the key. Show Uh, up and listen. And then and obviously he's implying you do things while you're there. You don't just show up and just kind of hang out and, and not try. But just That's getting there is a huge deal. That's your issue. <laughs> <laughs> I just show up and listen. I do need to practice. Okay, thanks, Bob. What, watching fine. watching YouTube videos and, and buying DVDs and all this stuff is, is, is fine. But uh, if you're not going to class regularly and you're not getting input from your instructor um, – those are those are two big things that will help you get good at jujitsu. Yeah, and you know uh, the instructor part. The instructor has been doing the game for a long time, and you're probably going to be a newer person in this game. You may be getting all this information from YouTube or the internet, this and that. But your instructor is going to put you on a path to get good. Your instructor is going to explain how stuff works. Going to look at your game. Going to point out the mistakes you're making which you don't get when you're watching youtube or or whatever you don't have somebody saying hey your hand should be turned like this your hand should be here your head should be here so there are a lot of stuff um, that you do miss and and i can tell you for me myself i uh best uh app i've ever bought for jujitsu or any dvd but uh, i bought the uh, uh really delgado uh, legal leg locks and I watched that every day, and I drilled it every day, and, and I thought I was pretty darn good at it. Um, I ended up, uh, uh, Roly came to town for a seminar. I took a seminar and a private lesson with Roly. And I tell you, there were so many things I missed from that app. Just little things that in the, the one uh, one hour private lesson and the three hour seminar, you wouldn't believe like that next week how much better my ankle locks got just from little things he showed me that I was missing that I didn't necessarily pick out of the app. So uh, that's, you know, my rant on these little things about your instructor there. I, I, uh, I would believe how much better your ankle locks got because I have ankles and they have been locked. <laughs> Lock the ankles down. I do like how the article was written in a kind of, he put like a whole bunch of spaces above it and a whole bunch below to where it's like, where's the article? Where, you know, it kind of yeah. took me. He, yeah. I think he's trying to make that happen and it worked. Yeah, it worked. And and I 
I don't know. This may have been the best article I've ever read. And, and I'm not just saying that. I mean, it's just right to the point. And make sure you do scroll down because you will think you missed everything. But um, and also check out his uh, his page. Uh, I I saw some other good articles on there that we'll probably use for future uh, future episodes. Yeah, um, I'll put a link so, to the article. Uh, I would yep. say largely unneeded. But uh, yep. click on that and then go find his page there, and he's got a yeah. whole list of articles that are that Yeah, are this is one we could actually, instead of putting a link, we could just write it ourselves and put it <laughs> on there. And it would still only take about 15 seconds. But, yeah, and then I got him choking want, me out. We want uh, Kane to get credit for this. Absolutely. It's uh, well written there. Not a whole lot of wasted yeah. space. A lot of There's some wasted space, to be honest. But not a whole lot of wasted words yes. or letters, you know. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe his Man, website host charges him by the letter. Yep. So simple article, simple point, guys. Uh, you know, even listen to the podcast. Don't get too hung up on it. If you miss, if you miss a week, you know, we'll be you know download it a different week or whatever. Don't make it. Be, show up to class. Go train. You know, that's the main thing. And, yeah, uh, yep. Yeah, show up. Show up and train. Or as uh, Ken Promolo's t-shirts, he used to have the STFU. Uh, uh, I want to keep this PG. So well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, yeah. STFU and train. Speaking of the FU part of the show here, Gary, uh, th- this is uh, the interviews are a little bit more explicit than regularly uh, uh, than, than we regularly have. So, uh, well, that, like, heck of a segue there, Gary. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of f bombs in the uh, in the interviews, uh, which I hope you're okay yeah, with. We, um, we it's, don't it's mind. A rare thing. It's, we just don't want to fill our whole episode with uh, f bombs and, and a bombs and whatever other kind of bombs we can get. Yeah. Just choke bombs. Yeah, yep, and legal leg lock bombs. Yeah, but uh, if if you are offended by uh, a little bit uh, harsher language than typical, uh, just uh, be be warned about these interviews that we have today on this episode, and uh, maybe the next episode will be better for you. Usually we don't have any – usually the language is pretty clean, but uh, it's just uh, – just, you know, no one no one's uh, dropping f bombs for any good reason here. They're just casual conversation. They come out, and that's – and I left them in, so – uh, that's what we got this week, Gary. <laughs> so that's the warning. Um, so there's your warning. And now let's get on to the interview. You're really going to enjoy this. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He once started a wave at the ADCC. 23 people drowned. He has vowed to never repeat this act of carelessness. He did forward rolls to the top of Mount Everest. He once shrimped so hard he accidentally opened a red lobster. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Go for the submission, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Jason Gagno to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Jason, thanks for coming on the show with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yep, happy to have you on. Um, you're in the you're on this mission series event. It's June twentieth. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but first, let's hear a little bit about you and and uh, and what you do. Um, cool. Yeah. No, I'm uh, I'm a brown belt under Cobrinha. Um, trained under him out of uh, uh, Alliance in Los Angeles. Uh, when I'm in town, and I also run my own club um, back in Canada, near Vancouver, uh, a town called Abbotsford, um, which is Genesis Martial Arts. How long have you been training? Uh, I've been training for almost eight years now. Almost eight years now. And have you been with Cobrinha the entire time, or have you moved a little bit? Uh, no, I started with uh, a local club here in Vancouver called West Coast. Um, when I was there... Until about three years ago, um, yeah, and then it was sort of time for me to leave. Just sort of, just sort of, just time, you know, it's just one of those things. Yeah, yeah. Um, to move on, and I had the opportunity to do my own thing um, through my um, business partners and stuff. Um, my, my partner Lloyd, who's uh, one of my best friends, and uh, we. We did that, so we did our own thing. So it, and I'd already been training with Cobrinha for a little while, so the the transition there was pretty easy. So was it about three years ago you start, you opened up your own uh, your, your the gym there? Genesis yeah, Martial Arts? Yeah, okay. we, we started talking about about three years ago. We've been open now for a little bit over two. Okay. And how's that going? 
No, gym's going good. Yeah, no, we're we're pretty busy. Um, membership's growing. We've got a big kids program. Lots of lots of guys competing. Lots of uh, masters guys competing too, which is really cool. So yeah, it's, uh, no complaints. We got lots of talented guys there. How often do you go in and train uh, at Cabrini's gym? Um, we get down to LA at least five or six times a year. Um, so, so fairly regularly, always before the big tournaments, before Worlds and Pants. Um, I get time down with Cabrini. Um, like last year, I get time with him uh, at the European camp. So, so I get I get quite a bit of time with, with Cabrini and the guys down there, Fabio and Isaac and Rob and all, all the other studs. How how is it for you training um, at home and being like the main instructor, and then going and, and like a few every other month or so, five six times a year, and and going to that school and then coming back with that information? How does that does that work pretty well for you, or is it sometimes difficult to for to make the trip over and train? Um, it, it can be difficult just in the sense that I don't necessarily have the. I mean, I've got some really talented guys training with me. Um, so that's great, but I mean, there's no comparison to training with Cobrinia. So yeah. it's just, uh, you just don't get beat up as much at home. It's the only, the only difference. <laughs> but we try to do everything back home. I try to run my classes and structure them the same way Cobrinia would. Um, we drill the same. We have access to his website, Cobrinia Online. So we stay pretty up to date with the techniques. And um, when I'm down there, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have, you know, be good friends with guys like Isaac Bottervine and Ramanada and stuff like that. And, um, I always get to uh, get to spend time drilling with them and see what they're working on and uh, bring that back to Nistro. So Nistro's a monster, and he's always uh, super happy to show me some, some cool stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty lucky in that regard. That's cool. It's it's different um, than if you were there all the time. Uh, maybe that you, when you come home, you're really focused on those things that you learn and you, and you don't get distracted as easily as you would if you're in the gym every day, like – seeing with the i don't know maybe, maybe i'm wrong but um it really gives you some focus when you get home and you've got some stuff to work on is that right is that true yeah definitely as, as far as the in the sense of like the drilling and stuff goes yeah for the for the most part i mean honestly like i love to train so <laughs> i don't really you know like even when i'm here i don't ever skip practices or, or not work hard because i just really enjoy training so um you know, I don't really have a problem with motivation in that sense. Um, but as far as like being technically pushed and stuff goes, when I get back, I definitely um, always have an emphasis on trying to like implement in my game some of the the crazy stuff that they're developing down there. Cool. Um, Could you describe your sure. style of jujitsu? What do you like to do? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely. I would say I'm pretty well rounded. Um, you know, I'm comfortable anywhere it goes on the mat. Um, I like to pass, but probably I would call myself a guard player. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to say my style. I like a little bit of everything. So um, I'm sort of comfortable just wherever we end up. That's good. Do you prefer gi or no gi? Or? Um, I like the gi. For the last little while, I've been training mainly in the gi, probably for about the last year. And I've just been getting back into training more no gi in the last, like month or so um i had a shoulder injury last summer so with with my shoulder being injured it was just a lot more comfortable to play off my back and be a little bit sort of more lazy whereas you know obviously no gi you have to rely on wrestling a little bit more um so my shoulder's been good now for about the last six months and i'm feeling confident in it again so i've been getting back to the no gi as well uh when you were training with your shoulder injury i imagine you couldn't do all of the techniques you like to do and you kind of had to alter your game a little bit is that true? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm not one of those people that believes in, in like, taking time completely off. Yeah. You know, when you're injured, I, I'll just, you know, like, change the the training around my shoulders. So when it was bad, I, I was sort of um, playing a lot more, like, spider guards and open guards where I, I didn't have to, like, keep the weight, like, keep people's weight on top of me as much. Um so it's sort of, you know, it's a blessing in disguise, right? Because it forces you to to sort of, like, look at things and, and maybe change some things and work on an aspect of your game that you might not have normally worked on, right? Yeah, right on. So uh, now that your shoulder's better, um, do you still do some of the things that maybe you wouldn't even worked on uh, with the hurt shoulder? Have you added some stuff to your game, maybe? 
Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, there's definitely the the time I spent um, with my shoulder not being great. I couldn't rely on, um, you know, playing very much half guard or sit-up guard or anything like that. So I was supposed to play a lot more off my back, which is something um, like more long-range guards off my back, like more spider and, and like uh, Delahiva and, and such. Just something Cobrini has been telling me to do for a while. So um, it was great to get to spend the time to really um, explore those guards and, and develop them and be able to implement them now in my game. Yeah. It's from my, in my experience, it's always frustrating getting injured, but um, if you're able to keep training a little bit, you end up changing things a little bit, and and uh, you'll work on stuff that you didn't intend on, uh, but in the long run, it'll work out for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah, exactly like you said there. You know, it sucks when it happens, and it sucks when you can't do something or something hurts, and it shouldn't, but... Um, you know, in the end, it, it, I think it makes you stronger. So yeah. Well, cool. You've got um, you're in the submission series event that's coming up on the twentieth. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it's cool, man. You know, the, I guess the second one they're doing now in the East Coast. Um, I saw the first one. The card was great, and uh, they messaged me after the first one and asked me if I'd be interested in participating. And I was so great away. I've never been out to the east coast of Canada. I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world with jiu-jitsu, but haven't really got to explore too much in my own country. So I'm pretty <laughs> excited to, to go out there and uh, rip it up. Cool. And it, the, it's not your typical uh, jiu-jitsu match. It's a little different, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, 15 minutes mission only. Is, is the match. Okay, and how are you uh, preparing for that? Um, yeah, I'm not really changing things too much. I'm doing some longer rules. Um, you know, my game is always uh, pretty submission-oriented anyways. So anytime I've done submission-only tournaments, I've always done really well. Um, you know, I'm gearing up for Worlds now anyway, so I'm training hard. I'll be in good shape. Uh, so for now, I'm just sort of looking at that, you know, doing lots of longer rounds, though. So. Um, but but the training is really the same. I'm always training hard, so it would be good. Yeah, you, so you're always training hard. Could you tell me a little bit about your training schedule, what, what like a week looks like for you? Uh, yeah, for sure, absolutely. So uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, I get to the gym about 9, uh, warm up with a little bit of drilling, and then 10 o'clock we start rolling. We'll roll from 10 to maybe like 11, 15. Um, then we have a class that I teach. So I teach and then drill with the guys for another hour, um, come home, rest, and then uh, I'm back at the gym for about 4.30 to teach the kids, and then I start training with the guys again from 6 to about 9. Um, Tuesday, Thursdays, the drill in the morning, I usually do yoga, and I'll do some sort of conditioning, and then again, I'm in the gym about 5 o'clock drilling, and um, I start teaching at 6, teaching and training with the guys. So. Wow, that sounds yeah. busy. Those are those are uh, full days. Yeah, it's, it's good though. You know, I, yeah. I like to. I say typically I'm training between four and six hours a day. Um, Saturdays and Sundays I usually I usually work out both days or maybe go for a run or something depending on the weather. Um, if it's nice out, then I'll you know do something else. I climb the mountain or go for a long run or something. But um, I don't train as much. I sort of rest on the Saturdays and Sundays. Usually only train like two or three hours, something like that. You mentioned a little bit of off the mat training, running, yoga, that sort of thing. Um, how does that affect what you do? Uh, well, I think it all helps. I, I, you know, like personally, my my opinion of jiu jitsu is it's sort of one of those sports where you kind of have to be a jack of all trades. You know, you need to be strong, you need to have the cardio, you need to be flexible. So um, I think it's important to to train all those aspects. You know, so I, I try to get yoga in a couple days a week to make sure I'm feeling loose. And my hips are feeling good and open, you know. Um, the running's good. It's also good for keeping the weight down, you know, for when we're making weight, which is good. And then, uh, like, lifting weights and doing CrossFit, that sort of stuff is obviously um, awesome, you know, directly relates to Do you do that sort of thing? The strength, do, right? Are you doing the strength training on the weekends or during the week? Uh, during the week, usually, like, I'll do that Tuesday, Thursdays, or... Sometimes after the lunchtime training on the Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Um, I don't have specific days for when I do those. I try to get in like three or four workouts a week, but I just go by yeah. how I'm feeling. So if, if we had like a really hard like daytime training, like today we we trained pretty hard for you know from the morning until like twelve thirty or something. So 
Um, I was thinking about lifting weights, but I decided not to, so I'll, I'll lift either tonight or tomorrow after training. So, well, it sounds like you have a good system. Um, so you train really hard all week. You you work out during the weekend, but not as much. How do you feel coming in Monday morning usually? Monday morning usually I'm good. You know, I, I get all my training in Sunday. Um, early, like we, we do an open mat and we train from like 10 to 12, so we'll okay. roll for an hour, drill for an hour. And then usually I'll just like either go for a little run or lightly lift some weights. And then I spend, you know, the rest of the afternoon usually just hanging out with the wife or playing with my dogs or something, you know, just relaxing. So by Monday morning, I'm usually good to go. Do you feel different that day than you do towards the end of the week after, after the longer days of training? Uh, yeah, for sure. Usually by like Thursday night, you're starting to feel like kind of burnt out. You know, you've been putting in, like, lots of long hours and lots of rolling. Um, but on Thursday, you know, it's good. Friday's just sort of that mental push where you're like, okay, you know, we've got one more day of bar training, and then Saturday just on your light. So, um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely tired by the end of the week, but yeah. on Monday you're good to go again. So, so like, up in, leading to, like, a big event, do you kind of take it easy in the last few days before the event, or how do you change your schedule? Yeah, the last week. I'll go a lot lighter. Um, a lot of like drilling, lots of like lighter sort of slow rolling. Um, I'll still train hard and still do like good workouts, but uh, like high intensity but short periods. So, um, like I might only do like one or two hard rolls in the session, and the rest will be pretty light or drilling. Um, I might do like a really hard like four minute cross the workout, and then just some light stuff or light jog, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, tell me a little, like a, a little bit about your diet and what you do and how that affects what you do. Um, yeah, I just try to eat like real food. I don't eat anything processed really. So lots of vegetables, meat, and, um, you know, for my cards, I'll have like brown rice or quinoa, or sweet potatoes, stuff like that. Um, I used to I try to do like the whole paleo thing, yeah, which is good. It keeps your weight low, but I just found with like the the amount of training we're doing without having any carbs is just too much. It would just be like so run down. So I had to I had to up, up the carb intake. But um, yeah, I mean basically I just don't eat anything processed. Lots of healthy fats, lots of lots of protein. Um, you know, sounds like, like a, just just clean, just good clean eating. Sounds like a healthy. Uh, diet. How long did you try the paleo diet? Um, I'd say I did it for about a year. Oh, did you? Probably about about three years ago. Yeah, on and off for about a year. It, it's good. I mean, like, um, you know, it's just tough without the carbs, man. With how much we're training, we're training like two or three times a day. Like, yeah, you just can't keep it up. Your body just breaks down. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, I had to I had to scrap that bad boy or modify it. I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, somebody said uh, once to me that if you um, to find out if your food's good, uh, look on the look for the ingredient list, and if it's got like um, you know, like that little list at the bottom where it has all what's in it, if it's got one of those, it's not good food. Like it just should be something simple, something that's kind of dot your on. You're just eating like real foods, foods that don't have a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you're looking at the back of a. You know, a rapper or something, and you don't know what the hell half the shit is, and yeah. you're probably uh, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. You know, <laughs> you pick up a carrot; and it doesn't have an ingredient list on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's sort of that's sort of yeah, that's sort of exactly what I do. You mentioned that the paleo diet you dropped uh, is good for like cutting some weight. Maybe what weight do you compete at? Um, I sort of bounce. Uh, I, I try to do feather. Um, I've, I've done light as well, um, but I'm, I'm sort of in between is my problem, and I'm finding now as I'm starting to get older, the weight's getting harder and harder to, to make for Feather, um, just, you know, just naturally getting a little bit bigger, but um, I'm still doing Feather for the big ones, like for Worlds, I'll, I'll compete at the Feather weight. Cool. How, one, how old are you? 54. I'm 28. 28, Okay. Yeah, I found it. Early, my early thirties is when I'm 35 now, and they're like, yeah, I'm getting a little heavier. I'm not like changing a ton, but it's just I'm not this. I'm not quite the same weight that I was five or so years ago. 
I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I talked to myself, man. Like, yeah, it was about 25. My metabolism started to slow down a little bit. But um, I'm just, like, a little bit thicker now, you know, like, in uh, in my midsection and stuff. Like, I'm not really any less lean or anything. I'm just, because um, I'm quite tall, I'm just, I'm just, like, a little bit wider. So, I don't know. What the deal is with that? Just getting older, I yeah. guess. That, and that can, I mean... As I gain a few pounds, and I, I don't compete a whole bunch, but it, it doesn't hurt on the mat, you know, to be a little heavier than it was when I was a little lighter, as far as the, just rolling and having fun. Oh, for sure, for training? <laughs> Man, I, I live in, like, uh, Abbotsford, sort of like a, I mean, it's a, it's a big city, and we're sort of a suburb of Vancouver, but it's it's a big farm city, so, man, I've got some big boys. <laughs> like, my daytime training, man, like, I'm, I'm the smallest guy there by far, everyone's like, between 190 and you know 180 and and 250. <laughs> wow! You know, I, I got some big boys. To <laughs> with. So well, it's, you know, it's good. Definitely good having that extra four or five pounds floating around to protect the wrists when they're on top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it it does uh, it does help out a little bit. Could you tell me a little bit about yeah. your opponent? Do you know anything about him? Um, not too much. I know he's, I know he's a, a local guy from out there, but he trains at a club out here on the island. I guess he works out there. Um, other than that, you know, I've seen a couple of his matches online. He looks good. Um, you know, everyone I talk to that, I, I don't know him personally, but everyone I've talked to, um, you know, says he's a great guy and nice jujitsu. So I'm, I'm, you know, it's always, it's always cool to, to, to fight guys that are, that are good and to fight guys that are, that are good dudes. So it should be fun. Cool. You've done a lot of competing. Have you done any like super fights or any competition where it's just one match for the day? Um, yeah, yeah. I've done quite a few super fights and stuff out this way or, or like, uh, you know, brackets with like two guys that, that were, um, climbed out and stuff. So, um, yeah, I've done, done quite a few. How was that, uh, different compared to hit, like getting a big tournament where, you know, you're going to have, have a lot of matches in the day. Um, you know, to be honest, mentally, I don't really look at it too much differently. Um, you know, like it, it, in those tournaments, every fight is like is like a super fight. You know, yeah. in, the, in the in the brown belt at Worlds and Pans, like everybody's so good, and if you don't win that match, you're not moving on to the next one, right? So you, you sort of have to treat every fight like it's it's the final, right? So that's exactly how I, I look at the super fights the same. It's just it's the final, right? Yeah. So, so, sort of so you mentioned that you I'm bringing in. Yeah, that's that's good. You mentioned that you enjoy like going for the submission and, and going after that. Is that um why do you think that you you got the call to, to go to this event? Is that a big reason why? Um, yeah, maybe. I mean I, I definitely finished quite a bit. I think also um there's not probably too many Canadians that have, um, you know, they wanted to highlight, I think, I think some Canadian talent. And I mean, there's definitely some super talented Canadians, but there isn't like a ton and there isn't a ton with, with a lot of, um, you know, with a lot of like credentials that are out there that have like won some, some bigger IBJJF tournaments and stuff. So, I think they're going to try to highlight, you know, guys that have done that, you know, guys like myself or, or like looking at like Darson, um, who's awesome or Ostap, you know, guys that are out there and, and really just ripping it up. And that's just the name of few. I mean, there's quite a bit, but you know, not as many as say there are Americans or Brazilians, right? Yeah. I'm, I actually, you mentioned Ostap. I've, we had him on the show quite a while ago, but he's uh, a <clears throat> great competitor and, and uh, just so knowledgeable about jujitsu and, and full of great advice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I don't like you said. I don't know those guys personally. There, there's sort of, um, for sure, like a big gap here in Canada yeah. between like the West Coast guys and the East Coast guys. Um, but I mean, I've got a ton of respect for those guys. I've watched, you know, a lot of them compete um, over the years, especially like being at Pans and Worlds. And I mean, they they bring it, man. They've got some, they've got some really talented guys out east there. So, um, you know. Be pretty cool. Yeah. So you've got a lot going on. You've got your school there, and you compete a bunch. Uh, what are your goals for the year? Yeah, I don't know. I've got uh, the Worlds coming up. Yeah. Um, in May, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I can do well there. And then uh, I get that one coming up, and then we're off to American Nationals um, in July. And then after that, I don't know. 
I don't really have anything else planned. I know uh, I'll probably take August and maybe rest a little bit, and then September I'll be back getting ready. I definitely want to do Nogi Pans and Worlds this year as well. So cool, man. Stay busy. And how about with the school? <laughs> yeah. How about your goals with the school? Oh man, yeah, no school. We just want to keep pressing. You know, our numbers have been good. We've been there. Um, location we're at for about two years now, so um, we just want to keep keep growing, keep growing the programs, and uh, you know our goal is definitely to be looking at moving into a bigger space in the next couple of years. So. All right, sounds like you got the right uh, mix of people there to to do that for you uh, or with. Um, yeah, you know I've got some I've got some uh, some incredible business partners that are there and. Um, my wife helps out, and uh, my business partner's wife helps out a lot, um, and they're they're fantastic. So I definitely have, have no complaints on that end. What do you do before you compete? Like the like ten twenty minutes before the competition starts, uh, what are you doing to get ready for that? Um, for me, I like to be really warm. So, um, you know, I'm just sort of usually in the bullpen, just doing burpees and squats and trying to break a sweat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I really like to have, like, a good sweat going. I, I know for me, like, when I'm in the gym, usually the first roll, second roll, I have even a hard time breaking a sweat because I think, I, you know, I train so much and I'm in pretty good shape. So I, I like to make sure, you know, usually by the third or fourth roll, you're feeling good and you're starting to move properly. So I, I try to, like, uh, have that feeling going into my first match, so be warm, be sweating, uh, be loose, and just be ready to rock. Sounds good. Have you experienced uh, going in to compete and not being properly warmed up and had a negative experience with that? Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, for me, man, when I when we uh, when they get scheduled for those mornings, you know, like the nine a.m. start times, yeah, ah, uh, those those kill me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's so hard to, uh, to to get going that early. I find to to rev the motor up in the morning. It, you know, I need like an hour. I gotta like go for a run or something <laughs> before I get to the venue, just to just to like get the heart pumping. So yeah, I've definitely definitely struggled um, once or twice with having those early starts and come out there and you know you lose your first match and you're like, what the hell happened? <laughs> but you know that's that's just that's just part of the game, yeah. I guess. Yeah. yeah, you got a lot of students there at your school. If if you have a student that's fairly new and they're gonna do their first tournament, what advice would you give them? Oh man, you know, it happens all the time. We actually have a big one coming up here. Um, is uh, the CBJJF Provincials is coming up in June, and I have probably like ten guys going to be doing their first. Ten guys and girls going to be doing their first tournament. Wow. Um, yeah, at least that. So it's cool. I'm pretty excited for for that from a coaching aspect. But um, yeah, no. The first thing I always tell them is just don't even don't even worry about the outcome. Just go have fun. You know. Just think about being on the mats at the gym. Um, have a good time, fight your hardest, and just don't don't even worry about it. It's all experience. In your first tournament, you know you're not you know you're not expected to do anything. You know you just get to go out there and you get to go out there with no pressure and just just not worry about it. And either way, they're going to learn and they're going to grow from the experience. So there's no losing. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. You mentioned that a lot of times when you train, you're this you're, you're fairly like a small guy on the mat compared to some guys who are like two sixty. Um, what advice do you have for somebody who's uh, smaller and and trying to um, either compete with or just uh, roll with and do well uh, against a larger person? Yeah, for uh, for smaller guys, um, <laughs> don't be stationary. Don't sit there and get smashed. <laughs> you, know, you got to be moving all the time. Um, Use use your ranges. You know it's very important for smaller guys to to use the range and to use your limbs. You know to play your spiders or your dalahivas and stuff like that to keep the guy off of you. You know it's, you don't want to be sitting there in the bottom of half guard with a big dude laying on top of you and trying to grind your way up and and trying to muscle him because that's not gonna it's not gonna work out very well for you. Could you go yeah. into a little bit deeper about using your ranges? Uh, what you mean by that? A little bit more. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, when you're playing a guard, you have you have so many different ranges, right? So, for example, like a half guard would be a close range, a butterfly yeah. would be a close range guard, but the guy's going to be right on top of you, and one mistake is going to result in him smashing onto you, right? Um, whereas you look at like something like a spider guard, he has to penetrate from that long range guard to even get into a close range guard to be able to put that weight on you, right? So, um, 
you know, if you can utilize those those longer ranges to, to keep the weight off of you as a smaller person, um, you're going to probably save yourself a lot of uh, a lot of uh, painful cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what would be a good goal for a student during their first year of training? Good goal. Oh man, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I would say like probably the, in the first year, um, uh, like if I was going to tell one of my guys, the first thing you want to do is, is just to be able to identify, um, problematic situations. Um, because a big, big thing with white belts is, um, they're not identifying early when they're getting in, into trouble. If you can start to do that, you can start to prevent things, um, you know, prevent problems from happening, um, which would be good. Another thing I would say is focus on learning the technique. Um, and don't even worry about the the outcome in the beginning. Just worry about learning the technique and learning to be able to move properly because um, once you get that, the outcome will, will come on its own later on. Cool. That's I think that's really good advice for, for new students or for people who are even in that, like, low past the new range that – um, it's it's hard to do these techniques to somebody else when they're when they know what you're doing and they they know how to do it. Um, just keep focusing on the technique and, and and the results will get there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, it's just tough for anybody. You know, like if I'm rolling with Cobrini, a lot of times I can I can feel what's happening, but you know, you just you can't do a thing <laughs> about it, right? And I, I'm sure a lot of people can identify with that same problem, but it's it's just the fact that you know his his technique is so good and everything's so precise. It's like you know, standing in front of a truck that you can't move. Yeah. <laughs> you can't move from, right? So, yeah. Um, but if you believe in the technique and you, you keep working it, it might not work the first month or the second month or the third month, but, you know, eventually it's going to start to work. You're going to figure out the timing. You're going to figure out, you know, what sort of energy you're looking for from, from your partner, and, and you're going to be able to put it together. Right on. If you could go, like, back in time and give yourself some advice when you're a new student, um, what would you give yourself in particular, would you say? Probably for me, when I started, I was really spazzy. <laughs> for myself, I would yeah. probably tell myself just to calm down and not worry about about trying to like win in practice because I think a lot of people, um, and myself included, I was, I was probably the worst because I was super spazzy and I've always been pretty competitive. So, you know, I think that's one of the worst things you can do for yourself is, is try to you know, try to win, try to treat practice like it's a competition because it's not. It's better if you can, you know, try new things, put yourself in different situations, try to learn the techniques, and, and you're going to grow a lot faster. And, and I can see it. I mean, you can see it night and day between the way we train now and the way the way we used to train, like when I started, and how good, um, like how good my guys can get in like six months of training compared to where they were six months back in the day. It's 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 ridiculous. Yeah, I feel the same way. Like. I look at a student who's got about a year of experience. Any any of the students have a year. They would have just destroyed me when I was at a year. Um, just just the way um, that there's more people teaching it to them. The way the way their learning techniques is, is better, maybe. But just just the way that they're they're able to pick it up a little bit differently or uh, different training methods, maybe. But uh, it seems like people are getting better at jujitsu quicker uh, today than they were before. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I, I think about like that. Like there are certain things like I didn't even learn until like purple belt, like really basic like guard recovery stuff. You know, that you didn't even pick up until like starting to train with Cobrini at purple belt. And you think about it now, my white belts are doing it. And I'm like, oh man, you know, like what the hell were we doing back then? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any sponsors you want to mention? Um, yeah, for sure. Man. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have. Uh, to have the support of, of quite a few companies. So, um, yeah, Rain Unlimited, that hooks me up with my geese. Um, Popeye Supplements out here with the, the supplements, which is awesome, in Coquitlam and Burnaby. Um, Sheepdogs CrossFit, which is out of Port Coquitlam. Um, Trafficking, Traffic Control Services. BJJDepot.ca, which is um, fantastic. It's probably the best uh, gee retailer um, in Canada. And then uh, Galicoto Clothing, they've got some some wicked stuff as well. Wow, you you do have a lot of good support there, and, and it's obviously that these companies have recognized you, and they want to want to get behind you and, and help you out. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm I'm super super fortunate, um, and I've been really fortunate as well to be always like building long term relationships. So you know, you start with one, add in a second, add in a third. But I think as long as you're 
you know, always trying to support those companies as much as they support you and, and uh, they'll stick with you. So I've been fortunate enough to be able to, um, you know, like Popeyes have been with them for like over five years, you know, Sheepdog's been like four years. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, really lucky to have the support of great companies like them. Are those local in your area there? Um, Popeyes is a local company. Rain is a key company out of LA. Okay. Um, they're about a year old and they're, they're doing some wicked stuff. They've got some really nice keys. Um, Sheepdogs is local. Traffic King is local. BJJ Depot, um, they're local, but they do all of Canada. And then Galicoto, um, Bong was out of the UK. Um, and now he's just moved down to San Diego. Cool. If, if an athlete's looking to get their first sponsor, do you, would you recommend that they start uh, locally or, or just start nationwide and try to find somebody? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think starting locally is probably the best way to go. Um, one of the best things you can do is just get out there and talk to people and just sort of get your name out there. I mean, obviously, doing well in competition helps. I know for me, for my first sponsor, I, I knew Brad from Popeyes already. So um, having him in definitely helps <laughs> when, yeah. when uh, you know, I think someone's looking at two people to sponsor and they know one of them already is, is a good guy and going to support the brand well, then that's, that's going to help. So if you can get out there and network with people and just just be sincere and, and um, you know, try to help their company as much as they're trying to help you, you got to be able to offer something in, in return. Then, um, you know, the companies hopefully will see potential in you. Right on. You develop that long-term relationship and, and that's mutual beneficial. How could yeah, exactly. That's so important. Yeah. How could somebody uh, follow you and keep up with what you're doing, Jason? Um, you guys can you can check me out on uh, Facebook, it's, uh, Jason Alexander Gagnon BJJ, or on Instagram at uh, Grillo BJJ, which is G R I L O BJJ. And uh, yeah, I try to stay pretty active on the social media as much as I can. Jason, I uh, really appreciate you getting on here with me and and talking about your upcoming events that you have going on. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the uh, Submission Series Pro coming up on the twentieth. Thanks for thanks for getting with us and, and giving us all that great advice too. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure to talk about jujitsu and, and uh, uh, share the little bit of experience I have. Well, cool. We'll look for you at the turn at the at the event there. Thanks, man. Yes, yeah, it's going to be awesome. I can't wait. All right, talk to you later, man. Bye. All right, my friends. I'm happy to bring Josh Wincy to the BJJ Break podcast. Josh, welcome to the show. What's up, Byron? Good to be here, man. Good to have you here. You are competing on the Submission Series Pro uh, submission-only event on June 20th. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu under uh, my coach, uh, Kevin Taylor. He had a black belt from Henzo back in 2008, I believe. Um, I've been training with him since 2005. Um, and it, it's pretty much it, man. Like, jiu-jitsu, is, I pretty much centered most of my life around jiu-jitsu since I started. It, it's kind of the, the one thing that's been a constant <laughs> since then. And a lot of other things have changed many times. And where are you training out of? What city? I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, my gym is called Titans Mixed Martial Arts, or Titans Fitness Academy. Um, we sort of... Uh, core group of guys tend to call ourselves the Taylor Gang, kind of a little play on the, uh, <laughs> the sort of Rick Khalifa thing, and our coach is Kevin Taylor, and then, you know, we just the utmost respect uh, for him, so, so uh, he didn't really want to, want to use that name, but we just started registering a tournament and stuff under it anyway, so it's become a thing, and people don't know what it is, so too bad for him. <laughs> what got you started in jiu-jitsu? Um, my, uh, a good buddy of mine that I grew up with, uh, his name is John Gale. He's a, a brown belt now at our club. Um, he's now actually in medical school and stuff like that, too. So he's been, his priorities have changed a little bit. So he didn't get promoted with me. We got promoted together all the way up through brown belt. Um, so as sweet as it was to get my black belt, it, it, it did feel a little bit weird kind of leaving him behind, you know, not having enough to celebrate with him. Yeah. But back in 2005, he's a bit smaller than me. And like, Growing up, we did what all boys do, right? We were always wrestling in the basement, having little boxing matches, and admission wrestling matches, even though we didn't really know what it was or what we were doing. But, like, I could always beat him. I was always a little bit bigger, and I'd always end up finding my way into a, into a guillotine choke, which I, I had no idea what that was at the time, but I could make him tap with it. So 
that's what would always happen. And he started doing jujitsu. He found it through like a friend of a friend and uh, heard about Kevin Taylor and Peter Martel. So he started training basically because he was at a frat party in his like it was probably like his first, maybe second year university, and very nearly got into a fight with a, a really huge uh, basketball player. He's like almost seven feet tall and, and much much bigger than him. And uh, luckily for him, it didn't that didn't end up happening. But afterwards, he's kind of thinking, "Holy shit, man! Like if, if I would have had to fight this guy, like what?" what could I do? Like, how do small guys beat bigger guys? Yeah. So he gets on the internet, like, you know, just kind of going crazy and, you know, discovers submission grappling and, you know, like the old boss rooting, uh, street fighting tapes and like vicious heel hooks and things <laughs> like that. And became obsessed with foot locks and he'd be at parties and just run up, oh man, let me see your leg for a second and put you in a heel hook or something stupid. And he just became obsessed with it. Then he found out about Titan. He started going to train there. And, uh, then, then, all like the shit talk started big time right like oh man you've never taught me that again like let's wrestle and, and I just didn't believe him I, I just I didn't really know what it was myself I thought it was kind of like a traditional martial art I'm like man I'm lifting weight blocks I'm, I'm really fit there's no way you'd ever beat me or, or I'd grapple me you know I'm bigger than you I'm stronger than you and so we went to the Y the local Y and C to work out together and, uh, we threw the max down in the gymnasium and taught me probably 40 times in a row with a like headman trying to choke from inside his face guard, just over and over and over and over. And I, I, I like my brain short circuited. Like I couldn't understand what was happening. So I was like, you know what? I'm coming out tomorrow. I'm gonna check this place out with you. Went in there, got absolutely destroyed, and loved it. Like was just mesmerized by the fact that that there's people not even just out there in the world, but like nearby, like in my hometown, that know this magical shit it's been so easily just tying me up in a knot and I, I was just one not okay that there were people who knew how to do that stuff and I didn't but especially my best friend I couldn't have him knowing how to do that stuff to me and me not be able to return it so, <laughs> but so I didn't really have a choice and I've been there ever since how long had he been training before he uh, got you on the mat there at the Y like four or five weeks maybe oh that's hilarious like, and that was the other thing like he had just started he's just going on about it every night every night oh man you wouldn't believe what we did at jiu-jitsu tonight and like most people do you know i i whenever i say jiu-jitsu back to him i do those little like karate chop hand motions and you know the stuff that takes <laughs> us all off and, up. and, and uh, yeah so so it was only like four weeks and that's what what got me too i was like man this guy's only been going to like two maybe three classes a week for a month and I'm literally helpless against wow. him now. Like it, it, yeah, it was kind of, it's pretty crazy. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Josh, what do you do off the mat? Sorry, sorry, what did he do off the mat? Yeah, no, what do you do off the mat in your spare time? Oh, sorry, like, so, yeah, I, I work, like, I work a nine-hour day, so I'm, I put in 45 hours a week at the office. Um, my normal training, like, on a normal week, like, I'll train, like, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll either take off and rest, or if I'm feeling a little bit energetic, I'll go do a bit of strength and conditioning. Then I'll train Thursdays, usually Friday, uh, strength and conditioning Saturday morning, and then then the cycle repeats on Sunday. So I, I try not to take more than one day off of like physical activity, just because I don't feel like I really can like to stay relevant. Because you know most of these guys on the circuit and on the scene now, like they don't even work at all, or or you know they their job is private and, and stuff like that. So they're getting paid by jujitsu or I don't have that luxury. Like I can't pay my bills with that. So I feel like, you know, basically when I'm not at work, I have to either be on the mat or studying jujitsu or putting in some kind of work for my strength and conditioning. Like it's it, like my, my, <laughs> my friends I grew up with from outside of jujitsu kind of, I don't know really what they think of me anymore to be honest. Like I, <laughs> I don't do a whole lot. Like, I don't go out and drink. I don't go out and party. Like, I go to bed at, like, 10 o'clock at night, even on the weekends. Like, I, you know, I got married in August, so it's, like, on the other side of that, I'm a husband as well, so, I, you know, I'm not home a whole lot, so it's kind of like work, training, conditioning, watching matches, studying videos, hanging out with my wife, and going to sleep and repeating that. Well, cool. Congratulations on getting married. That's a, a big Thank milestone. You, yeah. Big moves. Yeah. Um, so you're at work a lot. Do you, have you ever, I'm sure everybody who you work with knows that you do jujitsu just out of just 
knowing who you work with, I guess, have you ever brought anybody in and, and got them to stick with jujitsu? Yeah. Yeah, actually pretty cool. Like one guy shortly after I said, maybe like two months after that, one of my managers uh, wanted to come try it out. So he came in and, and he's like, a, he's really into it. He's just kind of like a, a, a gym rat. It's like a, not really like he's a smart guy. But he's kind of a meathead stereotypically. Right. Yeah. And uh, so in, like, I'm, you know, I'm between 160 and 170 usually. Maybe 160, 165, he's probably 220. So he came in and, you know, he never grappled before. So I ripped him up pretty good, which is which is pretty hilarious for the fact that uh, I was a brand new employee still on probation. I you know, <laughs> physically bust one of my managers' ass and then rag him about it the next day at work and stuff. So that was cool. But he kind of <laughs> dropped off the food chain, but... but as a result of him coming in, one of the other managers from the office wanted to come try it out about a month later. Um, and he, he stuck around. He's been putting in like four or five days a week right off the jump, loving getting submitted, like just, you know, the perfect attitude for it. And uh, he actually just got his blue belt on Thursday. So that, that's pretty sweet. He, that's the only person that I've ever had that I've recruited from outside of Jesus to come try it out. He's actually stuck with it and, and actually seen it rank. So I'm um, I'm really proud of that. that. That's kind of a funny story. You, uh, your brand new employee, you bring in uh, your future boss once you actually get technically hired, and uh, kind of just beat him up a little bit, and then then he goes back to work, and so for some reason somebody else wants to try this at work. Like they hear this story and think, I want to do that, and then he's then that guy goes and ends up sticking around. You know, um, Everybody has different, uh, like first day style stories or whatever. But do, do you, if you're going to bring in a friend today, would you do something differently than just kind of beat him up on the mat? Would you uh, handle it a little differently on your end? If if, if I had to do that again, yeah. Or would you, it, no, no. I mean, I, I beat them up, but it, I'm like I'm nice about it. Like it, <laughs> it, it's, it's always fun. You know, yeah. I, it's not like I'm not helpful, right? Like I'll, I'll tap them out and then tell them why that just happened. And, <laughs> You know, but and then maybe I'll slap their hand and do the exact same submission to them again and just laugh. But I, I'm not doing it to be an asshole. Yeah, I know, see. I see. Like That's that. funny. I find any time I roll with somebody who, who's brand new, um, no matter who they are, it, it's not the total old school mentality where where new people were kind of just thrown to the world and, and we're like fresh bait, like you know, and just be like ten years ago and stuff like yeah. that. But I feel like as a black belt or anything really there's any kind of a rank bother somebody's coming in brand new and they don't really know the essence of jiu-jitsu so when they slap your hand and you lock up like they're actually huffing and puffing and like really fighting for their life trying to kill you right or we're, we roll all the time it's not really like that so I feel like we have some responsibility at least in the first roll or two to establish the pecking order and, and just kind of smash them, not to hurt them or anything, obviously, They're not holding on to submissions, but, like, if I walked into any type of place to learn something new, and the first, you know, on the first night, I got to sort of test my, whatever it is, my skills head-to-head with the instructor, and maybe I don't really know if he's taking it easy, and I'm, like, somehow, like, you know, kind of competing with him, yeah. why would I want to give him my money? You know, if I feel like I can already kind of hold my own in there like a big shot, why do I want to pay to learn all this knowledge from them? So when somebody new comes in, the first time they roll with them, always, even in the classes that I teach, I'm super nice and friendly and everything. But once we slap hands, I, like, I put a lot of pressure on and, you know, I'll try to tap them, but at least once a minute for however long we're going. The next time we roll, I'll, I won't. You know, I, I might tap them once or something and, and be a little bit more helpful, but I think at least in my experience, like the way I was introduced to jiu-jitsu, the, the, the level of respect that was um, sort of generated instantaneously was just, you know, was just crazy. So I, I, uh, I just think that senior adults have a responsibility to establish that, that pecking order and make sure that yeah. new people coming in like actually know that they really can't do anything. So, you know, you may as well tone it down sooner than later and actually start learning. Yeah, get them to, to slow things down and get them to try to to think and to learn, not just go in there and fight. That makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Could you describe your style of jiu-jitsu? Yeah, people, uh, like, I mean, I've got a pretty pretty submission-oriented style. Like, uh, I'm always hunting for the finish, and I mean, I, I have competed a decent amount, but I mean, nothing like, you know, the, the sort of professional full-time jiu-jitsu guys that I just didn't have um, 
to like the financial blessings, so to speak, when I was coming up, that I could put everything to the wayside and then find myself all over the place and train all day and, and be great. And I, you know, if I would have been able to, I would have. I, I passed up on lots of jobs. I dropped out of college, you know, just to prioritize training. Um, but obviously, like, uh, I just always had to have something else to, to actually keep a roof over my head and save my stomach and, and stuff like that. Um, but so, yeah, my style like is, is really submission oriented. Like I'm always going for the finish. I understand the IBJJF system and the points. I mean, I play yeah. that and I help guys get ready and stuff like that too. But that's not what's really in my mind when I'm when I'm rolling. Like I, I feel like the point if you're doing what you should be doing to chase the submission, you will accumulate the points. Like this whole points versus no points sort of nonsense dichotomy and online arguments that happen all the time. I find really tiresome because points are, are awarded for transitions and positions that you should be trying to attain anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, but everybody, if you ask other people I train, they'll get my style, they'll probably say something crazy and funky, like I, I don't know, man, I, I just kind of flow with the go when I'm going. I, I do a lot of, like, just spinning and in, inverted stuff and crazy guards and, you know, my, my guard passing style and what the, what did my buddy Chris do? I think he calls it like a bebop style or something stupid like that because I'm just like really fast <laughs> and always moving around and yeah. So I don't know. I'd say it's definitely a, a little bit different. Yeah. You know, like I think people who haven't rolled me before might be taken a little bit by surprise, maybe a little bit unorthodox. Well, should be fun to watch. Should be a fun style to watch. Yeah, man, for sure. I hope so. You train with some of the guys that were in the first submission series event, don't you? Yeah, I train with Josh Presley. He's actually. Uh, uh, one of my absolute best friends, one of my main training partners, and uh, I actually caught him in his very first jujitsu class back when I was a blue belt. And now, you know, he books my ass on a regular basis. <laughs> yeah. cool. That's cool. So, and he fought Munch on the first one, and Munch just got his black belt too. So, and I don't imagine Presley would be too far behind. So that'll be an exciting time too. Yeah, it's it's fun to watch everybody come up together and 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 grow and and develop. Dude, it's amazing. Like, on that note, like, when I started training, our club had, like, my two instructors, I mean, my main instructor is Kevin Taylor, but, uh, but Peter Marcel is also a black belt under him, so they came up together. He's been there the whole time as well. Um, they were brown belt. And then, uh, then, I mean, you've probably heard of a guy called Jake McKenzie. Yeah. He's, like, a, a really renowned half bed player, and, and he's from my, my province. He's from a little town about 40 minutes away. Um, but he used to train at, at this club full time as well, kind of before he came up and, and started accomplishing all his accolades. He was a blue belt. Uh, we had a guy named Roger Hallett, who's uh, kind of a Canadian MMA star. He's fought in the UFC a couple of times, and his dad is a super famous boxer and kickboxer um, in Canada and North America. He just passed away a little while ago, but Roger's a, a huge, huge, hulking, strong dude. He was a blue belt. So it was like, if you were a blue belt, if you were a god, and like, I remember thinking, like, I don't even care. Like, I want to get a black belt, but there's almost no such thing. Like, I've never seen one, you know? Yeah. Whereas now, you look at our club, like, some nights we've got, like, five black belts on the map who all belong, you know, who all belong to this club. And then, you know, five or six brown belts and ten purple belts. And it, it's just, it's crazy. It's complete, like, the pyramid's completely inverted from the way that it was, you know, when I came into the scene. That's cool, the way it's changing and growing there. Uh, I think all over the place, but especially where you're uh, training there. How has your strategy changed um, for the submission only tournament versus just a, a regular match or tournament? Um, it, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Like I, I, I try to train pretty, pretty hard. You know, make the most of my math time. And like I said, I'm, I'm always looking for the finish. So you know, I, I haven't really changed a whole lot. Like I, I've been, I've been taking less rest. Um, like in between rounds and rolling for longer rounds and stuff like that with pressure opponents just to, to get used to the 15 minutes and, you know, if, he, uh, if he's really fit, which I mean, I know, I know he is. And, you know, he wants, he wants to bring it and push the pace for 15 minutes. I want to be able to keep up. So that's pretty much the only thing I've been, uh, I've been changing. Just that type of stuff. Just trying to be a little bit smarter when I'm, when I'm in training, right? Like if I'm on top, really staying on top. If I can put a little bit more pressure you know, from the top, I, I, I want to be conscious of that, put the pressure down. But as far as really changing up strategies and stuff, I, I try not to really for any kind of a tournament. Like, I train really hard. I, I 
I mean, I'm sure everybody says that, like it's probably a cliche, but it, it's the same thing. Like Presley, Chris White, uh, you know, all the competitors that are gym normally in tournaments are coming up. We just, we just train how we train and then we, we go and fight. You mentioned before that you try to take uh, one or, or no days off a week of training or of, of physical activity. So help me out and just and learn what, how many times a week are you on the mat versus are you in off the mat training and, and what do you do off the mat? Uh, so on the mat, like, I got you through sort of like an average week to me, like Monday night. Like, I mean, always, always Monday through Friday. Like I'm always at work pretty much. Yeah. Eight to five sort of thing. Right. So Mondays I'll normally be on the mat from six thirty, six fifteen, six thirty until nine thirty, nine forty five. Tuesdays, I'll be on the mats from 6 until 8, 8.30. Uh, Wednesdays, I usually almost never do jujitsu on Wednesdays. Wednesdays, either a rest day or if for whatever reason, like maybe, uh, you know, on Monday and Tuesday, I, for whatever reason, I, I didn't roll that hard or maybe I didn't roll with like a lot of big guys. There's a lot of big guys on my team, right? So like a, I'm used to giving up 50 or 100 pounds to dudes who are like purple and brown wow, belts yeah. really hard, right? And 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 they quite want to smash me too, so they're not really being nice about the size difference. So if, if I roll with a lot of guys my size, sometimes I'll, I'll I won't feel so deep down on Wednesday and I'll I'll go in and I'll do like some kettlebells or, or something like that. But Wednesday's either conditioning or rest and then Thursday, kind of the same as Tuesday. After work I'll I'll hit the math at six, I'll be there till eight eight thirty. Friday same uh, Saturday mornings, me, Josh Presley, and actually the dude there from my work who, who just got promoted to blue belt. Uh, we all go in, we do some strength and conditioning. It's mostly centered around pedal belt um, for a couple of hours. Then the rest of Saturday is super lazy. Like, I'll take a nap, eat lots of food, like, go visit my mom and just totally lay low, go to bed early, get up, have breakfast on Sunday, pick the mask at 1, stay there till 3, 3.30, and that is the hardest day too. Like that, we, we, that's like our sort of competition day. Like you go in, you step the mound for seven or eight minutes with a minute rest, and uh, and you just go for like the whole time, sort of thing. Um, and then then I guess it repeats on Monday. So it's like if I do st- if I do conditioning on Wednesday instead of rest, sometimes I'll take Friday night as a as a rest off the mat. But it's, uh, I'm going at least at least five six days uh, for the every week. Does resting a, a day or two um, does that help you in the long run, or does it just you need time to do other things and to mentally recover? Or is it actually helping you in, in getting your game developed a little bit better? Oh, dude, rest rest is underrated, man. Like you know, like I said before, like if, if I had the opportunity to to live off of whatever, I mean, and this, this is the thing too. Like you know, and, and the hats off to all the guys who could do it. Like I'm, I'm in no way like a hater. It, it, you know, like, if anything, I'm envious. Um, but even the guys, you know, the guys who can live off of family money and, and, you know, like seminar money and things like that. But, but I think ultimately, like a lot of these young guys coming up, it's family money. Cause what else is there, right? Yeah. And so you can train full time and, you know, train two and three times a day. But when you're not on, like, you're not on the mat for, for 16 hours a day straight. So when you're not on the mat, like what do you really have to do? Everybody has some responsibilities, but it's like, you can eat good food. You know, if you want to nap between training sessions, you can do that and all this stuff, right? So with me, where it's like, and not just me, but but everybody out there who's like me, um, where I can't do that, right? I can't can't sneak off, like, just crawl under my desk and go to sleep for two hours, right? Like, I'll get fired. So (laughs) so I find, like, I I need need that, like, that day or two a week of of rest and physical activity and, and the other thing too is being at work is completely unrelated to jujitsu, but I mean it's still really taxing just on your mind and on your brain and it's you know, all the noise and all, all the, the thought and, and mental energy you have to put into what you're actually doing there. Then mixed with all the, the sort of physical activity and, and uh and the physical beat down and stuff like that, it, it I find it adds up. I actually broke um my orbital bone on a blow out fracture. I caught a heel uh, from actually Gavin Tucker, he was on the first event as well. Um, yeah, he taught me like a vicious upkick. It was actually he was getting ready for his last MMA fight. I wish I could remember his opponent's name, but I can't at the moment. 
Um, but yeah, he, so he's Gavin's super talented, super strong, like just a freak athlete. We're going no gi. I was trying to hold him down, going for a pass, and somehow one of his legs attention broke. One of his legs flew off, and his heel caught me right in the eyeball. What ended up happening was my eyeball got pushed back and smashed down the bone that separates your your sinus cavity from your eye socket. Oh man! I didn't realize that happened. So like a half hour after, um, and most of the swelling went away, and I was like, "Shit, you know that was a good shot." I felt a little like congested. I went to blow my nose, and that was because that wall wasn't there. There was nothing separating my sinus from my eye socket. So when I blew my nose, all the air from my sinus inflated my eye. Um, made me look like the dude from uh, that movie, The Goonies. It was messed up. <laughs> rushed down to the hot, rushed, rushed to the emergency room, got some CAT scans, and so that took me off the map for two, two and a half weeks. Obviously, it told me to stay off longer, but. I figured if I just don't blow my nose and I don't get smashed directly in the eyeball, I'll probably be okay. But yeah, I took about two and a half weeks off, but man, he's been a rest. When I hit it, when I went back, like, you know, every time you take some time off, I'm like, man, my cardio is going to be shit, you know? And I didn't think I'd really lose that much timing, but I thought I, I was kind of going to get whooped on a little bit just from being a bit behind and being yeah. a bit tired. But, like, you know, I, I still ate really clean and, like, I couldn't, uh, do jiu-jitsu and risk getting hit like around the eye and stuff like that but I still did like all my conditioning and all that stuff and man that two weeks off it's like I felt like an absolute monster dude I went back and just wrecked everybody so like you know I don't think that taking taking two weeks off is a good idea for most jiu-jitsu athletes but you know I, I think I'm gonna do that like I, like I recognized how good I felt and it, it's like you know there, there's no off season in this sport and there's no off season at my job, so it, it like you know I feel like I'm pretty much putting in like 18 hour days every day and stuff like that. And I think periodically I'm actually going to plan out like week or two long rest periods every few months and, and just recharge. Like before this event, actually, probably for most of the week before June 20th, I'm not going to do anything. I might run a little bit, but I'm just going to eat healthy and uh, and heal up my body. Yeah, that's interesting. We actually have talked about this quite a bit on the podcast. Um, it started with. Uh, John Kavanaugh talking about uh, when Conor McGregor got injured and he came back and he was way better. And um, nobody really knows what goes on, but uh, the big, the best story we had was that your brain still works at, at jiu-jitsu and maybe it it you know breaks down the fundamentals a little bit better for you with some time off and some time uh, to just uh, run through some things without you on the mat trying to learn new stuff all the time. And, and plus your body's going to heal and that's going to be a factor as well. But you're you know, your time that you spent injured and off the mat, it wasn't a real long time, but um, your brain never really left, I think, you know. And, and when you came back, you were healthy, and your brain was really fired up and motivated. <laughs> so that's always neat to see, and it happens, I think, more often than not, when you come back, you're a little bit better than when you left, if it's a short enough. Like, you know, any type of grappling sport, I mean, I, I'd say even definitely more so with wrestling, but any type of grappling sport, we're notorious for overtraining, man. Yeah. We're, we're notorious for the mentality of, of, of you know, I can't take any rest days, you know. The other guys aren't taking any rest days. My teammates aren't resting. My, my future opponents aren't resting. And I've got to be in there and I've got to grind. And, you know, it's better to grind through it. And to an extent, that's true, but but it, it's not, ultimately. Like, you have to treat your body properly. Yeah. Steve Maxwell, actually, uh, is... Uh, I'm a pretty big fan of his and, and some of his philosophies, and, and he's a big advocate of rest. I actually met him, I uh, did a, some kind of all work with him in New York a couple of years back, and um, he was telling me about, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's a runner, like a, like a long-distance runner. Yeah. And he said, this dude was so, like his body was so overtrained, um, like he just kept having diminishing returns in his performance and feeling like shit and his immune system was broken down and, and all this stuff. And he ended up thinking, I think he said it was something like nine months like, it was crazy. It's like a crazy amount of time where obviously he still ate healthy and, like, you know, stayed somewhat fit, but, like, he didn't he didn't work hard, like, at all. Um, and then he came back on the track after nine months and just pretty much immediately started setting PR. Wow. And that's what Steve had said. He was like, dude, like, you know, guys who are, are putting their bodies through the ringer day in and day out for years and years and years, like, that is cumulative effect. You know, and sometimes taking a week or two weeks off, even a month off, isn't completely going to be enough for everything, for your brain, your nervous system, you know, all your connective tissues, your muscles, for everything to completely heal up back to normal. This would be like, I don't, you know, I don't know if 
if he really needed the whole nine months, or you know, he could have accomplished that in two. Like I don't know. But uh, the anecdote was that he took about nine months off, went back on the track, and was just like an absolute stud. So you know, I'm not going to take it that far. I'm, I'm not going to take it with you. It doesn't say like that. Yeah. But I think there's there's somewhat of a medium that yeah. you know that we need to recognize sometimes. Yeah, well, that's that's cool, and and it. Um, I, one thing about jiu-jitsu is it'll occasionally provide you with a short-term injury where you have to take some time off and, and uh, you don't oh, have to yeah. do it on purpose all the time. Cause it just, you know, there's bumps and bruises with that come with the, with the sport. How much, uh, do you know about your opponent, um, on, you have on June 20th? Uh, you know what, man? Like not a whole lot. Honestly, like I didn't know his name when, uh, when Kat had sort of thrown it at me. Um, and I don't care, man, I'm down for anything. Like I'm, I'm, Super confident in my jujitsu and, and stuff like that. So, I, like I told Pat, anyway, I was like, dude, I don't really care who you get. Um, like, I'll do anything. So, he, he threw his name at me. And I think you pronounce his last name, Brunovsky. I think. Sorry <laughs> if that's uh, incorrect. His first name, like, like that's the thing. I'm, I'm unfamiliar. I don't know if it's pronounced Andre or Andres. He seems like a wicked jujitsu guy, though, man. Like, I, since, uh, since the match has been put together, I've looked him up a little bit on YouTube. And, but he, he just got, um, he just got third of Pan Am's, uh, ducked out to JT, his teammate. Like he won some, like, won a lot of ground balls, and he won, like, won Pan Am's and American Nationals or something like that. So, like, he's definitely good, you know. He recently beat Megaton, I think, in a match. And so I'm, I'm pretty psyched about it. But as far as, like, overall familiarity, like, I, I wouldn't have known who he was, like, had I, you know, had I not went and looked him up. But I know he's a black belt under Galval. I know, you know, he's, He's one of the main like Otto's guys, so he's certainly worthy. I'm pretty psyched about it. Yeah, that's that's the type of uh, opponent that you get excited to compete against. Oh, fucking right, man! Yeah. Uh, what do you do before you step on the mat to compete? Like the few minutes up until that? Not much, dude. Like the, the one thing I got to work on is warming up better. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I never want to get too too tired or, or tire my grips out too much, but. Like one of our one of our guys, uh, actually, fucking, he was on the first event too. Connor Stanford, he was in the main event against uh, John Stavak. He's like, we crop up. It's like this big joke. Like he doesn't warm up at all, like at all at all. Like he's sitting <laughs> totally stationary. His name will get called. He, Kyle's warm up as he stands up, puts his hands on his hips, kind of shoots his hips out one way, then the other way, then rolls his neck once or twice, and then he's ready to go. Like literally, that's his whole warm up. So I'm a, not that bad <laughs> at all, but uh, but I need to get a bit better. I, I don't know, man. I just try to stay in the zone. Like you know, it's not a fist fight, so I'm not getting myself all spiked up with adrenaline. Yeah. I just try to stay calm and, and intelligent. You know, visualize me going out there doing the stuff I want to do. Yeah. Well, it's been working for you so far. So uh, yeah, I'm not going to change system. anything now. Yeah. Um, you've had a lot of students you've helped coach and teach. If a student's going to do their first tournament. What advice do you have for them? Do it is, is the first bit. Like, no matter how long you've been training, just do it. Um, and have fun with it. Like, you know, try not to get too nervous. You're not going to get hurt. Well, I mean, we hope. But you know, it's not like an MMA fight or something where you may get, you know, seriously injured. Like, you're, you're probably going to be fine. Your pride might get hurt a little bit if you lose. But the biggest thing that I would say to somebody doing their first tournament is don't let the pressure get to you because nobody cares if you lose. You know, I used to get super nervous at local tournaments because uh, just like when I started and stuff like that, the community was so small and so so that everybody in the maritime provinces on the East Coast kind of knew who I was and always expected me to do really well and so did my team. And I always felt like I wasn't nervous at all. Oh, if I lose, I'm going to get hurt. Or like, uh, I just didn't want to like disappoint other people. Or, you know, I felt that maybe people had higher expectations of me than, than they should have. And I, I had to live up to that and, all this stuff. And at the end of the day, like, you know, people say it a million times, like 50% of people lose in their very first match. Yeah. You know, then, then another 50% lose in their next match. And nobody remembers that. Like, nobody cares enough. Like, you know, two weeks down the road, Joe Blow, that was at the tournament, he's just sitting there being like, oh man, remember when, when Josh Lindsay lost by two points there in that first round out of the 200 competitors? Like, no one cares. You know, it's all in your head. Just go do it. Have fun. Yeah, and, and I hate to say it, but it's it's uh, similar reaction if you win. Like in, in a little while, nobody really remembers. Like 
especially at the small tournaments when you're first starting. Um, go win. That's great. You know, but if you're going to be bragging about it two years from now, no one's going to remember that. You know, it's, it's, that's just, the thing, it's something dude, I, for I've you. I've been to a ton of local tournaments around here, and, uh, you know, I go and coach and watch and stuff like that, and the time that I don't compete in anymore. And, man, I couldn't even probably name three of the of the people who won brackets in, in the last one I was at. Like, it's, you know, <laughs> It's not it's, a big deal. It, yeah. It's fun. You know, obviously, like the big, you know, big, big tournaments and IBJJF tournaments, ABCs and, and yeah, things like yeah. that, where it, it kind of is something on the line. Well, yeah, take that a bit more seriously. But you're going to go out and do your first tournament as a white belt. None of it matters. Yeah. Go none, out there. Just, none of it matters. Whether you win or you lose, you're still a white belt. You know, <laughs> sorry to say it. No offense meant, but you still suck at jujitsu. Even if you win the white belt world, ultimately, you're still not good at jujitsu in general take it in stride, learn from it, and, and have fun with it. It, it. it changes the whole game. Like, once you've competed, you, you understand, you know, your sort of mindset regarding jiu-jitsu and the training is going to be different after your first tournament, for sure. Yeah. If you can go back in time and give yourself some advice when you were a new student, what would you say? When I was a new student? Yeah. Um, relaxed a little bit. Like, I, I was super OCD about jiu-jitsu, and like I said, you know, I, I had... Uh, dropped out of a of, of a community college degree like halfway through just because I thought that the trade I, I was going to be working might not allow me to, to train as much as I wanted to so I kind of just said fuck <laughs> it I'm just not going to go back and, and do the second year and you know I actually still owe some money on that <laughs> right now actually so well, that sucks I probably would have told myself to, to just do school I mean shit man like I train you know one of my best training partners his name's Chris White he's a brown belt He's like a, a practicing lawyer, you know, and he, he started doing jujitsu before he even went to law school. So it's like, it's possible to, to still get really good and, you know, build up the rest of your life around it and stuff like that. So I tell myself that. And, and on the other side is if you break a finger and some shit like that, take some time off and let it heal. My mentality was always like, oh, I can't take any time off. Like, I got to get to black belt. You know, my training partners aren't taking time off. I'll worry about it, you know, once I am really good at jiu-jitsu, I'll worry about it then. Or if, like, you know, not to imply that I'm really good at jiu-jitsu now, but it's kind of like that day has come now where now I'm worrying about it. And I've got, you know, a ton of fingers that just will never bend right and, you know, different joints and stuff that are, are tweaked forever. Which we're really, you know, there's, there's certain injuries and stuff like that and bumps and bruises you get that are going to be perpetual no matter what. Like my ears, you know, I don't care about those. They've been stuck for a long time, but... But some of my fingers and stuff, like, I, I wish I could use those a little bit better. And, and that was just stupidity, right? That was probably, I could have taken maybe two weeks off as a white belt and had, like, you know, perfect hands and perfect grips. And But, you know, I wanted to chase that black belt. So it's like now 10 years later, it's cool. I have a black belt, but my, my fingers are all fucked up. Well, it's probably better to have your eye uh, looking normal than your fingers, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. You know, if I was like torn ligaments in my knees and stuff like that, I'm, I'm sure I would have, I would have, you know, done the necessary diligence to heal that up. But, but little things that seem really insignificant, you know, like like I said, just dislocated. Like my my ring finger and my right hand, like I broke it, um, dislocated it before it was healed. Like broke it again. You know, then I went to Thailand and then uh, I did some Muay Thai, a little bit of jujitsu. But I, this was back in 2006. It, they didn't even really know what jiu-jitsu was, like, anywhere in Thailand at that time, really. Um, so I pretty much just got to grapple with, with other sort of foreign students, like, from the States and from different places in Europe who were familiar with MMA or did a bit of jiu-jitsu and stuff like that. But there were no, like, jiu-jitsu clubs like you hear about now. And, you know, like, uh, Tiger Muay Thai and jiu-jitsu, Stuart Cooper filmed that. Like, there was none, like, no jiu-jitsu yeah. there at the time. Um but, you know, my finger was still broken, so I'm there, like, hitting pads and stuff every day, just grinding through it. And, like I said, it, it would have been probably maybe 14 days from the initial break that I, I could have just let it go. So, yeah, white belts out there, insignificant little injuries, let them heal up, man. You'll thank yourself when you're older. Yep. I agree with that one. Um, do you have any sponsors you want to mention? Yeah, I'll give a shout-out to Triple V uh, Spike Company. They're going to help me out for this event, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll give a quick shout out to uh, a local company called Better Beard Company. Uh, they hooked me up with a little bit of product and stuff like that as well. Keep my beard looking fresh and clean. They're pretty sweet too. So anybody out there, any dudes on the uh, east coast of Canada, 
or anywhere nearby, make sure they ship. If you've got a beer, you've got a checker, you've got a beer company. All right. And how can somebody keep up with you or follow you online? Uh, you can check me out. I'm on Facebook. I'm not a, a big social media whore. I'm, I'm actually kind of behind the times. I don't even have a Twitter account or an Instagram account, but I'm on Facebook. Uh, my last name, Wincy, is, is pretty uh, pretty rare. Like in Canada, the, the only Wincy anywhere in the country are like my father's immediate family within like a generation or two. So I'm definitely the only Josh Wincy that they'll find on Facebook. So <laughs> hit me up, send me a message, add me as long as I'd be happy about that. Oh, cool. I'll put links to uh, your Facebook page and your uh, your gym as well on the show notes. Yeah, for people cool. To find. Well, cool. I appreciate you talking with us. I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, step on the mat on June 20th. Right on, Brian. Me too, man. All thanks right. Thanks for having me. Yep, thanks for being here. I'll catch you later. All right, sir. All right, that wraps up interviews with Jason Gagnon and Josh Wincy. Definitely check them out June 20th. Um, if you're not able to show up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, look for it online. Uh, check out submissionseriespro.ca for more details. I'll put links to them in the show notes. Uh, there's links to the guys' Facebook pages on the show notes as well. Check them out in, to, in their gyms. So, um, it was a stacked card, lots of great talent on the card. We're just lucky enough to get two of the guys to, to get in the same episode together. It's kind of cool. And uh, we're looking forward to this event. So. That's that's what's coming up in on, in June, Gary. Yep, definitely. Uh, June twentieth, nine exciting fifteen minute submission only fights. Uh, definitely don't want to miss it, Gary. It's been a while since we've mailed out a Beach Day Brick Gi Patch. Not because we haven't gotten reviews, because nobody's told us. Like you have to email us at bjbrick at gmail dot com and say, hey, I wrote you guys a review, um, and, and you live in the United States. I'll mail you a Gi Patch. That's pretty simple. Um, Very simple. So, we try to make it simple. Yeah, but we've got a couple of them up here, but uh, nobody emailed us, and, and one of them lives out of the country. But uh, we do appreciate the reviews. We really love seeing those, and it means a lot to us when people take the time out of their day to help us out by writing a review. It helps us get known by more people and uh, kind of get seen, I guess. So, uh, Gary, let's check out these reviews. You ready? Yeah, this is my favorite part. Yeah, we've got a review from Jethro. It says, great podcast for BJ players, new and beyond. Thank you. We've got one from JWARBJJ from Aus- in Australia. Always pretty interesting with heaps of info on comps, crappleers, and random stuff. Keep it real. Well, we're trying to keep it real. Yeah, real as you can get. Yeah. yeah. One time we got realer than that, and it was kind of a bit much. Um, yeah, we almost got arrested. Th- yeah. Well, we're not. I thought we were going to talk about that, Gary. Okay. <laughs> they were knocking on our door. And all of these are five star reviews, Gary. Man, they must be our friends. The last one, love it. Uh, this is by the Bear Guard, or Bear Guard. So, you know, that's Ooh. a good card. Um, I wouldn't want to be in a Bear's Guard. That, or anything to do with the fight in a bear. They yeah, say the best yeah. thing to do with a bear, though, is to turtle and cover your uh, back of your head cover and your, neck. Yeah, your, your private parts. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of play dead and they'll get bored. Well, isn't there one bear, though? There's one bear you play dead and one bear you climb a tree. <laughs> Problem is you got to know what bear it is. <laughs> the polar bear you climb the tree, I think. Polar bear, there's no trees. Dang it. I'm telling you, I don't care. I ain't going to take the time to figure out what bear's what. I'm running as fast as I can and hope that I'm with somebody who runs a little slower than me. Yep. And that would be that's why you, that's why you're always ankle locking me, Gary. I finally yep. figured it yep. out. And if that don't work, as soon as that bear gets to me, you know what I'm doing. I'm pulling guard. <laughs> Gary's pulling guard, and then you uh, then you lose your. Uh, that's Private pretty punch. much it. Yeah, you're yeah. dead. You have game over. Try to get his back, Gary. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I don't know if I could uh, <laughs> put hooks in. Yeah, that's true. So this is uh, Bear Guard. What he has to say here. I'm assuming he, but it could be a it could be a lady. But yep. uh, this is our friend Bear Guard. Uh, love it. First, it's a little late in coming. But I've been sitting on this for a while. Randy Couture danced like an angel, a giant cauliflowered ear angel. Okay, that takes us back to when uh, I was getting my mom on the show to review Randy Couture's Yeah, uh, Dancing with the Stars. This person has been listening for a while. Yeah, I don't know what episodes those are, but look up uh, when Randy Couture was uh, uh, Dancing with the Stars and find the similar, like, that week. And it has my mom on here given it. <laughs> she gave yeah. him like raving reviews every time, and then he got yeah. voted off the show. It so was he wasn't doing Dancing that with good. the Stars with Byron's mom. That was our top, <laughs> what we called it. So, and then he goes on. 
I wanted to let you all know that I've been listening to your podcast for about a year. Exact amount of time I've been rolling. Your shows are fun to listen to, and they are a great way for me to get my BJ fix in while I'm riding the trains here in Japan. So I guess he's in Japan. Um, thank you for all you're doing. Great job. I love that it's been it's an all belt levels podcast. Thanks again. Bear guard. And it says from the USA, but it says in Japan. So uh, wherever you are, uh, thanks yeah. for listening, buddy. Well, we actually do put out two podcasts each week. One is in English and one is in Japanese. And that's the nice thing is, uh, you know, we speak both languages. Yep. If you could find the one in that uh, that we have in Japanese. Uh, we'll, we'll send you out a patch. <laughs> we, we, because yes. it's like a unicorn. It's <laughs> mythical. Our voices aren't at all this at all similar, and the hosts are totally different. And it, it really isn't about jujitsu, but uh, but it's out there, right, Gary? Probably. It's out there. It, true. Gary, we forgot to mention uh, in the front of the podcast that uh, we do have an audiobook for sale if you want to help support the podcast, or if you're in your first year of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and you want a little bit of like uh, coaching uh, from me about what, what your first year is going to be like and some tips, it's um, your first year in BJJ audiobook, and it's available for download. There'll be a link to it in the show notes or on the website. It's a uh, great value. Uh, you're going to learn a lot, and it's only $11.99, and you'll get uh, – uh, help from Byron there. Byron will uh, guide you through your first year. So uh, definitely uh, going to help your game out there. So definitely appreciate that. Uh, we've had a, had a few sales, and that's been nice to help support the podcast and keep this uh, brick floating in the water. Oh, good one there. A floating brick. Yep, not every day. It's probably not a very well-made brick either. Nope, yep. <laughs> Bricks for flotation devices. <laughs> if you want to keep up with us and... and, and, and Follow along with the BJ Brick Podcast. You can sign up for our email list, go to the Facebook page on Facebook, or the website on the internet, and uh, and enter in your name and, and email address. And we send out an email every Tuesday uh, with the show notes and what's going on in, the, in this week's episode. So, and also, as always there, we appreciate you listening. Um, without you guys, uh, you know, like Byron was saying earlier, the, the reviews, uh, you know, we just love listening to them. We try to make this better every week. And if you uh, know anybody that you would like, that think would be a good guest on the show, you know, send us an email. Let us know on that, too. Um, and also, as we mention every time, if you happen to be uh, coming through Wichita, Kansas, uh, in the middle of the U.S., you know, hit us up. We'd love to train. Uh, we'll find time for you. Absolutely. Our email address is bjbrick at gmail.com or just hit us up on Facebook, uh, on our Facebook fan page or whatever. We'll be happy to get with you. Thanks for listening. Hey, put some music on and stay sweaty, my friends. And please shower. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs>